Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Joseph Hall. I'm the executive director of the Kelly Strayhorn Theater, a performing arts organization in Pittsburgh's East Liberty neighborhood. And of course, this is the University of Pittsburgh's Diversity Forum 2020. And you are um, in attendance during the Turn the World Inside Out Art as Activism session. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you to three incredible Pittsburgh-based artists, Brittany Chantel, Deep Shika Sharma, and Sarah Honey Young. Um, we're all really in for a treat. Whenever there are artists in the room, you are in for a treat. You have come to the right session. Let's breathe together. Let's learn together. Let's be with each other um, during this next hour and a half. I wanna tell you a little bit about how this session uh, will go. Uh, first, you need to know that we will use an extensive vocabulary that may include academic uh, terminology, that may include street language. Um, so, you know, be with us in that. You decide if your children should be in the room for our extensive language. I'll put that on you. I'll ask you to decide. Um, so we'll hear from all of the artists, they'll share a little bit about their practice. Um, just before that, I'll share a project with you that recently happened at the Kelly Strayhorn Theater. And then after all of us have uh, presented, we will hear uh, from the reviewers of the Art as Diversity. Um, they will share their selections uh, with us. Um, and just before that, we'll have a question and answer session. So please do put your questions in the chat of the uh, YouTube. Um, and those will get to us miraculously because it's 2020 and we are capable of so much. Um, so again, thank you so much for being with us. I wanna get into it so that we can um, really hear mostly from uh, the artists that we have with us. So I told you that I am from, uh, or I work at the Kelly Stringhorn Theater as the executive director. And I'd like to share with you a project that my organization, uh, KST as we're known colloquially, uh, collectively organized with six other arts organizations led by or in community with queer, Black, and people of color right here in Pittsburgh. It was a project at the intersection of variety show performance, telethon fundraiser, and an experiment in equitable fundraising and equitable philanthropy. So I'm going to share my um, presentation with you. Bear with me. I always like to talk through this. It's always awkward, but bear with me. Here we go. All right, I hope that now you are seeing the phenomenal Becca Zela Unguni. And I just wanna share this video with you so that you can see um, a lot of the folks who were involved. Dear lovers of the arts, we have learned so much during these tumultuous times. What we know for sure is that the arts are critical. Every one of us has seen the importance of art. Art brings us joy, it helps us communicate, it brings us together. We, as arts organizations, are experiencing the impacts of the pandemic. Planning, our markers of success, funding, our daily operations are interrupted. How can we fulfill our missions? How can we continue to share the life-affirming power of art? We can, together. Together. Together, we are thrilled to share Hotline Ring. Hotline Ring. Hotline Ring. A virtual fundraiser led by the Kelly Strayhorn Theater. Our missions, our supporters join together to enrich our region. Hotline Ring is a fundraiser. It's a dynamic representation of regional and national artists, projects, and programs. Our vision is for the arts to operate from a space of abundance. Affordable, accessible, aesthetically diverse, arts with outreach, and with education. By working together, we can showcase the incredible arts that Pittsburgh has to offer. We represent organizations in community with, or led by, queer, black, and people of color. We are a wide spectrum of artists and cultural workers. We are not alone. Our networks, our audiences, our communities will also come together. We will lead our values, our care, and our vision for the future. A future without the disproportionate ways that resources are distributed in our city. A future that explicitly empowers Black femme visionary leaders with a greater slice of the pie. Highline Ring will create shared resources. United, we will turn our focus from an organization's bottom line 
to a web of support for an arts community. Art lifts our spirits. It helps us survive unknown and painful times. We brought our organizations together so that the arts will persist in our communities. Hotline Ring will help us thrive. Join us. Join us. Join us. So that was the promo video uh, with amazing, brilliant, beautiful folks uh, who organized this. There were other folks behind the scenes as well. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about it. So first I need to share some context about where we are located. Um, so months before current protests, Allegheny County, which is the county in which uh, Pittsburgh is situated, declared racism a public health crisis. The Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council's 2018 Racial Equity and Arts Funding Report showed disparities in arts funding for organizations of color as compared to white organizations. And the city of Pittsburgh's Gender Equity Commission ostensibly reported that this city is the worst place for black women to live. Now, of course, black Pittsburgh residents have known this and didn't require funded reports to affirm our lived experiences. But here we are. So what do we do with all of this information that is neatly packaged for politicians, heads of foundations, donors, the business community, arts leaders, and so on? You know, my response, uh, the Kelly Strayhorn's response with six other arts organizations was, was Hotline Ring. Um, and Hotline Ring was a collective virtual fundraiser and a vision for equitable giving in Pittsburgh. When KST realized that hosting our annual in-person fundraiser wouldn't be feasible, um, we immediately explored the idea of a virtual fundraiser. And then we decided that that wasn't enough. We're not alone in this challenging moment. You know, there are so many important arts organizations led by or in community with queer black people of color that have for generations built this city, built Pittsburgh and many other cities. We've advanced the culture, raised the baby, supported careers, provided a home, we've cared, listened, celebrated, rejoiced. As the video says, the arts are critical. Art brings us joy, it helps us communicate, it brings us together. So for nearly four months, I'm gonna skip this video. For nearly four months, seven organizations met every Friday at 10 a.m. to collectively imagine a new way forward. All of our organizations fulfill our mission through the arts. We operate year round with paid staff. Our budgets are small to mid-sized and we have partnered with and admired each other for years. In this picture, you're, you're seeing some of those partners. This is Sandra E. Woodruff in the foreground uh, with Kelly Strayhorn. In the um, videos, you see Stacy Pearl and Herman Pearl. The smaller screen, you see Aaron Perry. Um, the, the organizations included One Hood Media, Boom Concepts, Braddock Carnegie Library Association, Dreams of Hope, The Legacy Arts Project, Pearl Art Studios, and of course, KST. And as an explicit way to address the dis disproportionate ways that resources are distributed in Pittsburgh, Black femme-led organizations received a greater portion of the pool that we raised. So we collectively raised um, this money together. Folks, donors uh, could call in, as you see Margot Cunningham on the phone. They could also donate online and you can select what organization you wanted to give to or you can contribute to the shared pool. So the shared pool of resources were distributed 40% to the Black Femme-led organizations. That was the Legacy Arts Project and Pearl Art Studios, and 60% to the remaining organizations, uh, to the remaining five organizations. And this was, this was loosely based on, um, you know, the, sti the statistic that Black women in the U.S. are paid 39% less than white men. Uh, and so together, we decided to close the gap by committing 40% of our shared pool. I'm sharing this as an example of really what arts organizations can do, what presenters can do, arts organizations that are um, you know, supporting artists that are kind of the first stop um, for many folks um, to experience culture in their city. Folks are always asking, well, what can I do? What are the resources? Give me an example. This is a small example. And this was an example done by a black queer led organization. And I just wonder how incredible it would be when this model or a similar model uh, is instituted within white led organizations that have you know, multi-million dollar budgets. This is just an example. Uh, we had phenomenal performances by the Dream Dreams of Hope, 
Um, you see a youth drag queen here uh, performing to an, a 90 song throwback. Uh, this is the Legacy Arts Project. Um, we had puppet karaoke uh, with Boom Concepts. This work can be fun, it can be joyous. <laughs> And I invite you to check out the whole seven hour long marathon of an event. Um, I posted the bit.ly at the end of this screen, but you can also go on to Facebook and um, just search for Kelly Strayhorn Theater. Um, so if you're working with organizations, mention this uh, to them. This might be a model um, that can kind of, you know, go throughout um, other organizations, presenting arts organizations. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to thank you for, for listening to me for a bit. I have a quick shout out. This t-shirt, I'm wearing you know, activism, art as activism on me. Uh, this was created by Ayana Moore. At that time in 2012, 2012, this was created by Ayana Moore. She was Pittsburgh based artist, now she is in Chicago. I'm wearing this as an example that none of this is new. We know that none of this is new, unfortunately. Um, and three of these artists are doing work right now in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I want to introduce our first artist, which is Brittany Chantel. Um, Brittany is a hip hop artist and activist. Brittany, I'd love to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, peace, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this panel, honestly. Uh, my name is Brittany Chantel. I'm a hip hop artist, visual artist, speaker, and activist. Um, I'm a One Hood Media artist, as well as a member of Veterans for Peace. Um, a little bit of background on me. I'm biracial. I identify as Black, but I do have privilege with my skin being white that I want to uh, make note of. I do not live the same life that my dad or my brother lives. Um, I also identify as a non-binary lesbian, and my pronouns are she, her, and they, them, and those can be used interchangeably. Um, I mistakenly joined the military at age 18, and I went to college at Edinburgh University um, for criminal justice. And I actually wanted to be a cop. And I was accepted into the Pennsylvania State Trooper Academy. But it wasn't, it was actually the murder of Michael Brown that made me realize I did not want to wear the same uniform as these murderers and be associated with them. And that occurred during my senior year in college. Um, a professor helped me recognize that no matter what, I myself would not be able to change the ways of police brutality. And I started to realize that I don't believe that there is such thing as good cops because cops have to uphold and enforce racist and unfair laws. So I graduated with this criminal justice degree and decided to kind of use that knowledge in a way that I'm sure my sure wasn't intended by my university and I put it towards activism. Um, so with that, you know, I always wanted to be an artist. I always wanted to be a hip hop artist as, as far as I can remember whenever I was a kid. And I wanted to be a visual artist. So I paired my knowledge with my experiences and started to tell my stories through art. So um, I wanna share a music video with y'all. And this music video I'm about to share is for a song I wrote in 2017 called Black Lives Matter. Ooh, I used to want to be a cop, never smoked pot, thought that it would kill my shot, and now I'm seeing all these flowers when I'm rolling around the block, nightmares of my family friends lying down in chalk, had to switch my plans, I don't want to be a cop, I don't want to wear a vest or a badge or a clock, I don't want to be sorted with that sickness, acquitted, never convicted, the system makes the murderer a fucking victim. Ooh, I'm so you scared, but you said you never have one. Then don't take the badge, don't accept it. Ooh, I'm so scared, but you said you never have one. Then don't take the badge, don't accept it. Yes, we have to act the same time we're 
small talk. Parents teach the kids never hang out in the block. And they shall never cross the street without the crosswalk. Never wanna see my own mom's widow's walk. And I just get to see, I just spent those and not mine and be divided. I decided to take the evidence provided. Police misguided, juries divided. There was supremacy unwinding, so we march away. Black lives matter, reciting, I'm singing that. Thank you. Um, so I decided to put that music video out um, with the with the help of One Hood um, in 2018. Um, it was right after the murder of Antoine Rose II, rest in power. Um, and you know, I've been trying to uh, really just tell my side of story, and that was my way to say, like, look, like I used to want to be a cop, and this is the way that. Uh, things have changed for me in my in my mindset. Um, so a large portion of you know my activism, especially recently, goes into uh, sharing my military experiences with people, primarily the youth, um, because they're being targeted by military recruiters in their communities and their schools. So I aim to provide students with my stories so that they can make a more informed decision about joining. Um, I don't like to tell folks not to join because I don't like telling people what to do with their lives. But I do have to say specifically that after the recent murder of uh, Vanessa Guillen, I'm almost screaming from the rooftops, trying to tell people, especially black indigenous people of color to not join because they have proven time and time and again that they don't really care about their people. The racism, colorism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, mental illness shaming, sexual harassment and assault is all alive and well in the military. And I experienced or witnessed these things in a place where there are set values and the army ingrains the, arm, the, the seven army values into your brain at basic training. And I'll, I'll never forget them loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Yet, if soldiers were really upheld to these values, the long list of isms and phobias and shaming wouldn't exist. Therefore, there's this environment that's created of hypocrisy and thus lack of trust and feeling um, of security. So um, with that being said, uh, the next music video I'm about to share is called uh, Jedi. It's for a song called Jedi. And it's from my recent album called The Golden Opportunity, which outlines many of my horrible experiences within my time in the army. And um, this song is about a friend from basic training who called me in the middle of the night asking me to support him through a mental health crisis. And because he wasn't receiving any support on his army base, even though he's, he asked multiple times. Um, I do want to give a content warning for this, um, that there is mention of uh, suicide and PTSD.
Thank you, thank you. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up with that because I wanna leave some more room for the Q&A at the end. Um, thank you for tuning in. Again, I'm honored to be a part of this and to share a little bit of my story and my activism um, or my artivism, um, as I like to say. Uh, you can find my music on all streaming platforms. And if you are somebody you know um, is looking to, to join the military, and you want a more in-depth conversation on my experiences, you can definitely contact me and I'll be more than happy to arrange a conversation to, to chat with you about it. Thank you again. Thank you, Brittany. That was powerful. Um, and thank you so much for sharing where folks can follow you. And I wonder if someone can actually put that in, a in the chat so we make sure that everyone has that information. I would love for folks to continue to uh, follow your work on all of the platforms. Um, next, I want to invite into the space uh, Deepshika Sharma from Rangoli, Pittsburgh, a group dedicated to uplifting the voices of South Asian LGBTQ plus community of Pittsburgh. Deepshika, thanks for joining us. Hi there, thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen real quick, though I can't find it. Where'd it go? <laughs> Oh, there it is, okay. All right, I'm Deepshika Sharma. Um, I am a Pittsburgh native, but my parents came over from India when I was a baby. I identify as bisexual. My gender is up in the air right now. Um, and I use the pronoun she, her. I'm a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh 2015. Um, and I'm so excited and honored to be here with you, with you folks. Um, this is super, this is such a cool space to be in. I'm so glad we're having these conversations. Um, so I am a part of Rangoli Pittsburgh. And if you haven't heard about us, you're in luck. Um, officially, we are a community initiative dedicated to creating community for and uplifting the voices of LGBTQ plus South Asians. 
that is LGBTQ individuals with ancestry from the countries of Afghanistan, Nepal, Pakistan, and India, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka in Pittsburgh. And for my own sake, I'm going to be using queer to refer to LGBTQ individuals as from this point on, just because it's a mouthful, but I do understand that not everybody is comfortable with the word queer to describe themselves. Um, unofficially, we're a group of young South Asians who were essentially brought together in 2017 and realized that we were here, we were queer, and suddenly we weren't the only queer South Asian people we knew. Um, we, choose, we chose the word Rangoli for ourselves because Rangoli is a primarily Indian art form that uses bright multicolored sand to create colorful and vibrant patterns. And you can see that our logo is a stylized Rangoli. Um, we thought it was a way to really capture the vibrancy of the South Asian queer community, though we also recognize that a Rangoli is a, you know, traditionally Hindu art form and um, the South Asian queer community involves includes individuals from all over South Asia and from many, many religions. Um, South Asia is an incredibly diverse and beautiful place and we are open to all of, all of our brethren. Um, so as an organization, we largely do community building work, which includes cool panels like this, town halls, movie screenings, writing and education workshops, vis visibility initiatives like our LGBTQ AAPI Day of Visibility, fundraising, and of course, our pride and joy and my pride and joy mirrors LGBTQ South Asian voices. So what is mirrors? Mirrors is a collection of poetry, photography, short fiction, essays, and art, and um, almost any other kind of, at least for the first edition, print expression by queer South Asians that we put together and released in May 2018. Uh, the content, was brought from various queer South Asians across the United States and the, it deals with themes of family, selfhood, coming out and representation. Um, mirrors as an idea is very tied to mirror or to Rangoli as an idea and which is also super tied to the landscape of Pittsburgh. Um, the three of our three of our co-founding members, including me, met for the first time in the summer of 2017 at Big Dog Coffee in the South Side. Um, at the time, we were part of a different organization trying to organize queer South Asians and or plain, not just queer South Asians in the region. Um, but this was the first time we had met together as queer South Asians. Um, and that's and something that really came out of our first meeting. And every time we met after that was this deep desire we had to see ourselves represented not just in community as queer South Asians, but in media also as queer South Asians. Because we were so used to having to choose between being either queer in predominantly very white spaces, um, especially in Pittsburgh, or South Asian in extremely cis hetero spaces. Um, what we wanted was a space just for us where we wouldn't have to choose between being queer or South Asian, but we could, as one of our co-founders and one of my closest friends stated, we could embrace our hyphens fully and completely without compromise. And seeing ourselves in media in that way was something we were all longing for. Um, so we put out a call for submissions in the fall slash winter of 2017. And though we wanted to keep the focus on mirrors Pittsburgh centric as really being from Pittsburgh is part of our hyphens. Um, we realized that we would want to solicit from anyone in our community who wanted to be heard. And so we put out a crowdfunding campaign and asked friends, family and community establishments to donate so that we could pay honorarians to our contributors because we believe you should be paid for your art. Um, and in the spring of 2018, the four of us took a couple of weeks, um, parked ourselves in Hillman Library every evening for six hours, wrote, edited, and designed, and proofed mirrors. Um, so that was that was that was a process for us, a big bonding moment. Um, and on the screen right now, I have up a spread for mirrors describing a photography project to queerify or South Asianify spaces the artist. Um, slash photographer inhabits that are othering or that are missing the completeness of his identity. Um, and fun fact, I was in some of these photos, which you can see in the full edition of Mirrors. Um, 
once we put everything together, we had our launch party. Um, I was so honored that uh, City of Asylum was so gracious enough to gift us the space to have our launch party. Um, we invited our contributors, contributors to come in, read their pieces, and if they were outside of Pittsburgh, we had them send in a, a clip reading their piece. And for you guys, I'm going to play um, Raksha by Gurnur Kausekon. Um, it's a lovely piece, and I'm happy to share it with you guys. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gunor Kaur Sekon. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. I'm a Punjabi American living in Wisconsin. I am a genderqueer woman, and I am a panromantic gray asexual. That is to say, I belong somewhere on the asexual spectrum, though I never seem to settle in one place, and my attractions are always romantic rather than sexual. I am studying English literature at the master's level, hoping to graduate this spring. I'm not sure what the future holds in terms of my career, what with my love of writing, splitting into so many different directions, but I know that I am moving across the country to be with the woman I love. This poem is called Raksha. They say princes rescue princesses to marry them but they forget princes can be brothers planning escapades or that princesses can be captured by the people you least suspect. A girl's honor becomes their weapon of choice. Anything is fair game when it comes to family. So they locked her away in the highest tower where the world watched her and forgot all about our hero in the making. If you can't fight dragons with swords, you can sneak past them in the shadows. Stories and secrets linger there, waiting to be heard if you'll listen. He did, always she told the best stories. A girl's honor becomes their weapon of choice. Anything is fair game when it comes to family. So she wore a veil over her hair and prayed to the great sages, and the world watched her as they put a sword of shadows in his hand. It was his turn to spin a tale, to twist fate. Kirpans are for kindness, for breaking shackles, for turning fire into smoke, and into his tail they disappeared. They say that knots are tied for eternal love, but they forget that love can mean the promise of a crimson-colored thread bonding a girl to her brother. One of my favorite pieces from Mirrors, although I can honestly say every piece from Mirrors is my favorite. Um, so uh, the response to Mirrors was absolutely incredible. It was overwhelming. Um, from our crowdfunding campaign to the people who came to the launch party to our random to random Instagram tags that we sometimes get when people see mirrors in the library. Um, we've been met with nothing but support and love for the project and Rangoli as a whole. Um, and really mirrors is what gave us the momentum to start doing deeper, more, you know, traditionally activist oriented work. Um, uh, but I wanted, but I do want to note that doing mirrors was a work of deep, deep activism. Um, our work is to become visible and that for as a niche group as we are can often mean simply existing and creating the space for us to be openly queer and South Asian. That is activism, creating space for ourselves, creating space for others like us when the world is often against us is a radical act. Art and not just things like mirrors, I'm talking about all queer art and making that art visible and public and just as loud as straight art is or white art is or all these normative art forms are, is the lens through which we can gather and communicate and become a community together. I want to note that we're not the only ones doing this kind of work, nor the first, and that we're working in a long tradition of queer art expression and expression, and especially zine making, um, which really forms a cornerstone of queer art. We felt like we were taking on a mountain, but we were really part of a large fabric of gorgeous queer expression that goes back decades. And in the case of South Asian queer art, hundreds, hundreds of years. 
the momentum from mirrors helped us put together bigger things that went just beyond producing art. For example, having the city and state declare June 1st LGBTQ AAPI Day of Visibility in 2019, because that day sits between the crux of AAPI Heritage Month, Asian American Pacific Islander, um, and Pride Month. And then this year for Day of Visibility, we use that momentum to host a drag show on Instagram featuring Asian and Pacific Islander drag artists from around the world and raise funds for Sisters PGH and Apollo, um, and some Apollo Pittsburgh and uh, some bail funds because this happened was happening at the very beginning of the protests. Um, many of the queens in the show were South Asian, are South Asian, reclaiming South Asian dance and music for themselves as queer individuals. Cultural expression helps define who we are and cultural expe expression is so important in di diaspora spaces as well. And so much of that cultural expression is rooted in art. Reclaiming art, creating our new art and redefining art by us for us is where this starts, this activism, but it's definitely not where it ends for us and we. We hope to keep doing this um, as long as we can and keep an eye out because the second edition of Mirrors will be out soon. And that's my, that's my bit. <laughs> Your bit was great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Deep Sheikah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. There was a question that I just want to pose to you quickly. Is mm -hmm. Mirrors part of the Hillman collection? This person says it seems perfect for the archive or for research. I believe that it is actually. Um, we were part of a zine fair in 20, 2019, I think. And um, some professors from GSWS came around and actually got a copy of Mirrors for the collection. So you can find it both at Hillman Library and Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. And Hillman Library is um, the University of Pittsburgh's library, uh, but you said it's also in the uh, Pittsburgh Public Library, uh, Carnegie. Uh, well. in the, at the main branch, yes. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, being in the space with us. Thank you for um, having me. And I want to introduce uh, another artist who is here with us and will be sharing, uh, Sarah Honey Young, a visual artist and photographer. I want to immediately hand it to you because I know you have some great things. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I want to preface this with saying I'm very nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm not quite used to talking to a computer instead of people as of yet because I do a lot of people facing work. But my name is Sarah Honey Young. Call me Honey for short. I'm a visual artist and a photographer. I'm originally from New York. Go ahead, Harlem. Um, but I've been in Pittsburgh for about six years. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to run through a few of my projects for you. So I'm going to share my screen. Boom. Okay, hopefully that works. I'm a millennial, but I still have tech issues sometimes. So, um, Again, my name is Honey. Um, I actually do a lot of stuff. I'm an event producer and DJ as well. I'll touch on that a little bit. My event collective is called The Most Beautifulest. It used to be called Darkness is Spreading, but we went through a brand change actually during the quarantine because darkness is spreading. It was a Dave Chappelle reference. If y'all are too young to know um, the true Hollywood stories, Rick James sketch, <laughs> go watch it after this. But um, that's basically where the name came from. But it, during quarantine, it just seemed a little dark to call something darkness is spreading. So our name is now Most Beautifulest. But the, uh, the stuff I'll be talking about today is primarily my photography work and some of my projects that I think really fit the theme of this forum. Um, so let me hope that this works correctly. Um, my artistic practice. As a creative director, photographer, and documentarian is defined by using portraits and video to explore identity, primarily Black womanhood and queer personhood, and to challenge a society that remains harsh to the marginalized and the intersectional. I consider the individuals I work with to, to be my co-curators, as well as my muses, and often shoot on location across the country in personal, intimate spaces of their choosing. By focusing my work on Black women, queer people, and our intersectionality, 
I aim to contextualize our very existence as its own museum of modern art, especially for those of us who don't believe our likenesses and experiences are reflected within the most revered exhibition spaces. Our communities and experiences aren't often enough reflected in the ongoing historical annals of our country. We deserve our story to be told and to function as a time capsule of activism and revolution in these transformative times. Uh, the first project I'm going to talk about is probably my most well-known one. It's called American Woman. I've been working on it since 2016. And this gorgeous woman right here, we will get to in a minute. If you don't recognize her, her name is Tarana Burke and she is the founder of the Me Too movement. And she's also a Harlem girl and one of my friends from back home. American Woman is a portrait and interview series documenting black women in America. Launched in July 2016 and currently spanning seven U.S. cities, the series pushes back against the stereotypical archetype most people picture and the characteristics most associate with the term American woman. It's about intersectionality, womanism, our complex relationship with this country, and the labor we are tasked with as its most resilient, brilliant population. So again, I've spanned um, seven cities thus far. I'm going to walk you through a few of the portraits within this uh, project, starting with Pittsburgh, PA, of course. This gorgeous goddess right here is Liana Menis. Um, she's done a lot of work. A lot of you might be familiar with her work with the Good People's Group. This is her portrait from American Woman, wearing beautiful jewelry by Tarane, by the way, who's an amazing, Art, artist here in Pittsburgh as well. This is Dr. Imani Walker from Los Angeles, California, Charlene Carruthers in Chicago, Illinois, and Queen Sharice Harrison Nelson in New Orleans, LA. So what's important to note about American Woman is all, I travel to every city. Some people think that I like sent photographers out. No, I travel to every single city to shoot these portraits and to interview these women. Some of them I knew before. Some of them I had just met or were recommended to me. They all picked what they wanted to wear. They all picked the location in which their portraits would be taken. It was very much so when I say that my my um, the people that are in my projects are my co-curators, I mean that very seriously. Um, so I'm pressing next on the wrong computer. I'm, I've got two computers going on right now. This is Denicio Truitt from New Orleans, LA. Uh, she's a maker, um, a, a amazing artist. She's also queer. A lot of women actually in this project are queer as well, because again, we're talking about intersectionality here. This is Ra Curry from New Orleans, LA. I mean, Louisiana, Lord. <laughs> Danny V from Atlanta and Morgan Bryant from, from Atlanta as well. A little thing about Danny actually, um, a hurricane actually took her entire house about a year after we shot these portraits. So it's not only an honor to have her be a part of this project, but it's also it, it means a lot to her to have the photos that we took that day because unfortunately almost everything you see in this photograph was lost. So I consider American Woman to be a time capsule project. I would love it if 20, 30, 50 years from now, if we still exist, Lord, get rid of Donald Trump, um, that people will be able to look back on this project and map exactly what Black womanhood looked like in America during this time. So again, we're back to Tarana, um, again, who is the founder of the Me Too movement. She's an extraordinary woman. Her work is phenomenal and very much needed. She has literally moved the needle of progress forward so thoroughly in just the past few years. Um, we actually took these photos in Harlem, right around the corner from where both of us actually lived. Um, she still lives there, I obviously don't. And we, um, we just wandered into the bodega. If you've ever been to New York or you're from New York, you know the bodega is the spot. And she basically was evoking um, Breakfast at Tiffany's and doing her own take on that Audrey Hepburn classic look. And I actually have a video I'm going to play for you where she explains that further.
and hopefully it plays. There we go. Wait, hold on. Uh oh, my video is not playing, y'all. Give me one second. I totally rehearsed this and everything. My name is Tawana. I am a senior director of programs for an organization called Girls for Gender Equity. Um, it's my day job. And my hustle, I'm a style blogger, a writer, um, working on a documentary, and odds and ends, a little bit of Olivia Popish on the side. <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind, not me. Um, I think of white women when I think American women. I don't think of black women or people of color. I think um, blonde hair, blue eye, you know, pearls and, and little black dresses and, you know, apple pie and gingham and <laughs> think of those things when I hear American women. You would have brought a Hudgie Hepburn. <laughs> Although she wasn't American, she's so part of American cinema history, and she was the quintessential woman, right? Very fair and 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 beautiful and just elegant and all of these things that people don't think of when they look at me, I'm sure, or look at most black women. But I wanted to do a play on the idea of delicate and elegant and, and um, beautiful and use her as an example, like, I love to dress, I love style, I love things that I think are elegant and beautiful, but you know, my bamboo earrings are beautiful to me, but most people would look at them and wouldn't say, oh, she's a delicate flower, look at her. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I wanted to kind of play with the idea of this delicate, beautiful, with this kind of like person who was not traditionally beautiful and who was not traditionally thought of as delicate in the hood. This is my neighborhood, this is where I'm from, this is where I eat, this is where I hang out. Um, and if I was coming home at five o'clock in the morning, I probably would be looking at Jimbo's spot for me. <laughs> so, you know, that's the scene. She's like early morning looking at Tiffany's kind of thing. So, yeah, that's where that came from. My name is Tarana, and I am a funky, fresh, dressed to impress, ready to party, round the way girl, American woman. Very good, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. A goddess. A goddess, a goddess amongst plebeians, Tarana Burke is. Um, I, I peeked in the chat. I did see someone ask about funding. Yes, I actually received the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant in 2016 to partially fund this project. I've also had patrons and donors who have came in over the years. If you go to, I'll put this in the chat to AmericanWoman.co, not .com, but .co. Um, that lists basically all of the funding avenues that I've received for American Woman thus far. Please put good energy in the universe for me because I actually applied for Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh 2020 to fund the completion of the documentary. So this video clip is one of over 60 that I either have already edited and you can see some of those either on the Facebook page, which is American Woman Project, or the Instagram, which is also American Woman Project. And there is so much more to do with this project. So hopefully I can finally finish that documentary. I did edit all of these videos myself. This is like a one woman creation, all of these videos. So it would be really great to have the funding to finish this documentary with actual professional editor. Um, so I'm not just like, Googling how to do this anymore. <laughs> so that's American Woman. My next project I'm going to talk about a, a, a shortly is called the Black Rest Gallery. This is a newer project. I actually have not debuted this on social media at all yet. Um, and I'm an Instagram girl. So um, I really do want to get this out there. So basically, um, we created this project, and I say we because, again, everybody in my project is my co-collaborators. Um, basically, we wanted to present 
Black people at rest. I was trying to say it deeper than that, but that's what it is. Black rest matters, Black joy matters. And there's a lot of things that we're seeing right now as a Black community, um, or really any community that actually gives a fuck, um, that is disturbing, it's triggering, it's upsetting. Um, and I wanted to present some joy um, to kind of juxtapose a lot of the, the work I'm doing right now, which is protest photography, which I will get to as well. So. Black people, take care of yourself. Make time and space to chill. Indulge in some shit you deserve, but keep talking yourself out of. Find some solace. Create new work to remind yourself and your people that it's okay to still seek pleasure. That one is for me, maybe for you too. The goal is to make it to the other side of the fight for liberation. And there's just as much gloriousness in our peace as there is in our resilience. Where there is unrest, there must be rest. So right now, this is just a collection of imagery. Um, I love video, so I might add a video component to this, this project in the future. But right now, again, this is a very new project that I am um, sharing, so you're seeing it in its infancy. Thank you and you're welcome. This um, amazing, gorgeous person is Chrissy Carter. She's a Black trans woman based here in Pittsburgh. A lot of you might know this beautiful face because she is out on the streets frequently fighting for our rights. Um, just, I can't say enough about Chrissy. I could spend the next hour gushing about this, this beautiful human right here. But a lot of the times, um, especially over the, the last few months, Chrissy has been on the street, you know, leading, organizing, um, angry. And so we were able to get away for a few days um, a couple months ago and just relax for a while before diving back into the storm. Chrissy again. I love this photography. None of this is altered either, y'all. This is just straight out the camera, the sun and water creating these beautiful lens flares. Like truly, I, I try to keep it humble, but I'm like in love <laughs> with these photos. I'm, I'm so, so proud of them. Christy wants more. It's almost like, like a baptism, isn't it? And I'm not, I'm not a religious person. Um, sorry, mom, but <laughs> I kind of probably will do a little bit more thought around, you know, what these photos mean to contextualize them later. This is another friend of mine named Timothy Vota. They are a makeup artist and flight attendant. Um, and again, just the melanin and water, the sun and a camera, that's all that went into these photos. Tim again, yes, queen. <laughs> basking in the beautiful sun. I miss California so very much. Timothy once again. This is Kennedy and Tressa, aka DJ Aesthetics. A lot of people in Pittsburgh might also know Tressa's work. She's an amazing organizer, amazing artist, amazing DJ, um, who's also part of my most beautifulest collective, Love Her to Pieces. Black women at rest. Like, aren't you just smiling right now? Tressa, Tressa, Tressa. My good, good, good girlfriend. So that's just a little peek at what I'm putting together for the Black Rest Gallery. Um, I guess now that I've debuted these for you all, I'll put them on Instagram at some point, but that was just a little treat for you all. Thank you. Now, let me get into, um, what I've been doing mostly as of late, which is protest photography. I want to hurry up because we still have a Q&A to get to, but there's a lot of things to be said about the usefulness and the purpose of photographers at uh, protests and actions. Um, Antoine Rose was actually my cousin Sharon's godson, so I was probably closest to that 
that murder. Um, and I, I, when I went to a lot of the actions for Antoine Rose a few years ago, I noticed that there were a lot of white photographers working for media outlets here in Pittsburgh that were disruptive, that were hopping in front of protesters, that were trying to get the money shot. And it, it made me angry. I didn't think before that I was the a photographer who would be photographing protests because I'm a protester myself. I'm an organizer myself. So this is basically a response and wanting to, these are a lot of my friends that are involved with these actions and asked me if I would do this. So that that is, I think the difference is being actually not only invited to actually take these photos, but being a part of the protest as well. I put down my camera all the time to start screaming, best believe. If you've seen me out there, you know this to be true. So I'm just gonna walk you through a few um, of my protest photos before I wrap. This was um, Pittsburgh Action for Black Trans Lives. Chrissy once again in her natural habitat, trying to make a damn change in this city. Blue is a job, black is a life. So I, I usually do not photograph children at actions. I actually don't see children at actions a lot, but I did get permission to take this photo. And I think that's important as well. Like don't put our youngins out here without their permission. Well, really their elders permission. Black trans lives matter period every day. Don't forget it. This is Timber Hudson, they, them, who was, um, leading this action as well. Amazing, amazing, amazing person right here who is always trying to bring attention to the hidden figures in the city. If you're at this action, no, if not, please um, keep abreast by uh, following Timber. Once again, look at those glasses, honey, period. <laughs> And this protest was organized by uh, Trans Uniting and True T Pittsburgh, very important organizations here in the city. Little Vogue broke out because Black Joy matters, right? <laughs> and there was actually a Black mother there and they collected money from white allies for this Black mother, which really brought tears to my eyes because I'm also a Black mother and it was really it was really important to see, you know, motherhood and black motherhood celebrated in that way. Thank you for the generosity. Book of spells, bruja, realness right there. Black girl magic, hashtag. Shout out to Kashawn Thompson, who is the founder of the black girl magic movement, by the way. Miracle from one hood. So there was a pinata that said cops and clan go hand in hand and it was burned on the ground and i love to see it this is Brittany murray uh during the juneteenth 2020 call to action and this is probably my i feel kind of funny saying my favorite protest photo but i think this is actually Brittany's profile photo on facebook right now it's just so very powerful to me because Black women are leading so many of these actions. Black women lead. So that's my time. Thank you so very, very much for allowing me to walk you through my work. I don't know where my mouse is to stop this screen share. Help me. Oh, thank you. Wait, there we go. Okay. Thank you, y'all for your time, your attention, and I am going to hand it back to you, Joseph. Thank you, honey, so much. Um, I have to say that all of you are getting lots of love on the chat, and I think it's always important to share that love, uh, because doing this, sharing, um, it's it's not just art, it's, it's uh, you know, it's your spirit, it's your body, it's your mind, it's so much of you. Um, so it takes a lot to, to do the, to do what you all just did. Um, so Brittany, when you were um, presenting, Ivy and Mario said, powerful song. Antonio said, thank you for raising awareness. Rachel said, thank you for sharing. Uh, Deep Chica, when you were presenting, uh, Ricky said, this is great. Thanks for sharing. Gretchen, amazing work. Paula, beautiful work. Honey, Gentile says, honey. <laughs> Um, Antonio says, Bodega Nostalgia. Bill says, love the Tims. 
Um, there were lots of folks uh, reminiscing about New York <laughs> during your session. So thanks for bringing us there. And you know, I have to say, um, I just moved back um, to Pittsburgh from New York where I lived for about six years in the Bronx. Um, and one of the things I was looking most forward to uh, was to go to Darkness is Spreading, was to dance was to shake, was to sweat, was to be in community. Um, and so, you know, I just danced by myself. Here we are. Um, I wanna do uh, another shout out for folks who weren't with us before. I just wanna say the shirt by Ayana Moore, done in 2012, white supremacy acquitted Zimmerman. Wanna shout her out. She was a, um, based in Pittsburgh, now she's in Chicago, a visual artist. I have some questions and I invite any of you, all of you um, to think about them and, and answer them. And folks who are on the chat, please um, feel free to submit your questions as well. Um, I think, you know, as I was kind of getting to before, art is, it's so personal. I feel like usually no matter what, but, you know, can, can personal art with no explicit political or social content, can it be activist? Um, or if, if the personal is political, does it even make sense to think of art in terms of personal and political? Should you like call on one of us or should we just leave it? <laughs> I'm open to whoever responds, whoever feels drawn to respond. I'll, I'll respond. I think all of my projects that are not for clients are personal um, and I think just because I'm a black queer woman living in America, <laughs> I think that that informs the fact that my personhood is politicized if we wanna keep it 100. So yeah, I absolutely think that, that personal projects can, can be political, that they can be activism. Um, I don't actually usually call my work activism. I let other people do that because I don't really like to define my work any more than I already do, which is honestly a lot. Um, but I think it really just depends on the intent and who your audience is. You know, sometimes with art specifically, you gotta let um, people decide what it is. So, but I, but I think the work that we're presenting is overtly activist and, and, and it also, it, like we all have like deep personal ties to this work as well, obviously. Yeah, art is so much of an exchange and whatever your intention is, you know, the viewer, the consumer, the person participating on the other end, bring their own kind of associations and experiences to it. Um, Deep Shika and Brittany, I wonder if you have um, a response to that kind of in this realm of personal and political um, in terms of your art. Um, I, I don't think I can say anything better than Honey just did because that was very well articulated. Um, in when I'm not doing work with Rangoli, I'm a writer and a poet occasionally. Um, and I think until I put that out there in the world to see, it stays political, or sorry, it stays personal. Um, but, you know, I think the very act, like Honey said, of me being in a body that is politicized, when I put that work out there, it becomes political. Um, because I can't ultimately control the way people, you know, interact with and see my work and also me. Brittany, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, I mean, I really just agree with everything um, that y'all are speaking on right now. I, again, I don't think I could really say anything more to that. Y'all pretty much, you know, articulated that um, on point. I would just say, you know, our experiences are politicized as well, you know? So if we are, if I write a song about me experiencing colorism, you know, and then I put that out for other people to hear, like there it is right there, you know what I'm saying? So um, I think that, you know, Honey, when you spoke on the intention um, that you have behind the art, that's it as well, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I think y'all said that perfectly. Okay. Um. And in, in thinking about art as, as activism or as political, how can art move its audience from awareness to engagement? Um, and, you know, I, is that even your goal? Um, so can art move its audience from awareness to engagement?
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm gonna say yes. Um, and there's so like I think that that's so layered, right? There's so many ways that that can manifest. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of work within multiple mediums, specifically like I'm looking to move my uh, my album into like a play, so that you know I have this album about my military experiences and and I'm hoping that youth listen to that and they can take, okay, you know, she's experiencing all these things. I might need to rethink about joining, but I feel still like an album doesn't speak to the full experience and I need to move that into a play. And I think with that, that changes that engagement, right? Like there's like different things that I can do in that setting that I can't do through Spotify. You know what I'm saying? So I think that, that that can change and 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 morph uh depending upon what you're trying to, to get out of your audience, you know. Cool. So there are a few questions um from uh, folks in the chat that I want to get to. Um there are a number of art teachers in the chat and they would like some advice about for arts educators of child age artists. Do any of you uh, work with with youth on a regular basis, or is um, you know young folks included in your art, or in general, just do you have any advice for these folks? Well, I have kids, so I work with children. <laughs> I have two kids. I have a son and a daughter. Um, Honestly, my, so I don't really work with children in my work because a lot of my work is is so politically charged and I want, like with American Woman, for example, 18 was mm. youngest. And actually nobody is even 18. I think the youngest American Woman participant is like 22 or something like that because I want, I want them to be an, an adult and a, able to really like say I give permission for this to be out here on this public level and exist forever I don't think a child should be able to make that choice but my daughter is in American Woman she is the only child in it um her portrait um actually debuted at Manchester Craftsman's Guild when I was part of the action movement revolution exhibition last year um as far as getting well, what, what is exactly the question? Getting kids engaged in art or do we involve kids in our art? Yeah, I, I am going to take it as a question about um, child aged artists um, and their relationship to activism perhaps. Mm. Um, how can kind of art educators guide a child aged artist um, who may have inclinations for activism or just a, a, an art teacher who themselves has inclination for, you know, greater equity in this world? I think that's actually an excellent question, particularly my daughter. My son is seven, so he his activism is like um, backyard again. <laughs> um, but my daughter is 15, um, and she's actually really well informed, like not only just the stuff they're talking about in school itself, but she, she like watches the news, like for real. Mm. I was, she's been doing that since she was like 10 years old. Like she will literally turn on the news. So she, these kids are really informed. They really like, what do we call them? Generation Z, Generation Zoom, love them. Um, they're really, really um, informed. And I think that letting them lead the conversation is like a good first step. Like what kind of change do you want to see in the world? They have a lot of opinions. Like we, we have to stop treating kids like they don't know anything. They know a lot, um, mm -hmm. especially with like, how into the internet they are they're they're like being educated on a level that we that i can't relate to i mean i'm a millennial but i'm i didn't have the internet when i was like 10. um so i think letting them lead like my daughter i'll give you an example my daughter's class a couple of years ago they were able to create their own apps they didn't actually program it but they could come up with the concept for it like and kind of take them through the steps of where it would be right before it was going to be like designed and built and my daughter <laughs> on her own i didn't even like give her any pointers she came up with an app that would basically allow anybody organizing a protest or action mm. to have people as security 
without involving like the cops, you know, for the safety of protests. And my daughter came up with that by herself. So I think letting the kids like talk to the educators about what do you want? What are you interested in? What are your concerns? And then kind of building the project from there would be a really good start. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you to your daughter. Hello. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, this next question is uh, for Brittany. Um, can you talk about your experiences dealing with colorism and sharing your work with people? Uh, this is from the chat. Yeah, totally. You know, this is a, a question um, that I think I could talk on for a really long time. Um, the experiences run deep, uh, you know, from childhood through my artistry and through current time. Um, you know, I when I first started to share my work in Pittsburgh, um, a lot of my work uh, spoke on the fact that I was Black. And um, there are some people who will see me and they immediately go, you black. And then there's other people that will see me and they legitimately believe 100% that I am white. Um, and so I was having difficulty talking about the subject that I was talking about um, and specifically in my poetry. Cause when I, when I first started sharing my artistry I was really just a spoken word poet. Um, it really and, and again, I could talk on this a long time. And I think that this, this it may, maybe, you know, I need to step aside and do like a panel discussion on colorism within the arts in Pittsburgh. Um, but it really wasn't until uh, One Hood approached me um, and asked me to be a One Hood artist that I felt really supported in the way that I identify and um, really supported in the fact that they would have my back when colorism presents itself. And, um, you know, I'm for that, I am ever grateful and they constantly have my back. And I think that that's something that um, without that, I don't know how things would really play out. You know, like I would still be sharing my art and, and things like that, but um, to have that kind of support in times that I was receiving so much hate and, and uh, yeah, I mean, really so much hate. Um, it's just so important, you know? So um, that's a, it's a heavy question. And I know we're running out of time. So I would love to, to you know, talk with people further on that, uh, maybe in a different form. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing what you did, Brittany. And I'll just offer, I am also a, a biracial person, white and black, and this is what we can look like. <laughs> you see Brittany, you see me. There is a spectrum to blackness, uh, just as there is the spectrum to uh, folks who live in Pittsburgh. Let's not believe in this binary of black and white. Pittsburgh has such a robust community uh, and we all deserve to be seen and heard. And that's one reason why we have these phenomenal artists here today. So I wanna to go uh, to one more question from the chat. Let's see what's here. Do, 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 do. How do we slow, this is a big one. <laughs> How do we slow the exodus of local artists and allow them to thrive here? If, if, <laughs> if we can't tackle that, another question I have is what do you need as artists, what do you need? Because I think maybe this is part of that question. And this is a question that's being asked by the National Performance Network, a national performance network, um, who's asking artists, what do you need? What do you three need um, to really thrive, specifically here in Pittsburgh? Uh, oh my gosh. I could talk so much about this. Oh my God, but we don't have time. We don't have time. Uh, <laughs> there definitely is like a mass exodus of, of our artists leaving Pittsburgh. That is something that has been happening since I arrived in 2014 and something that we tried to tackle with 1839 MAG, which was, you know, that was before you, Joseph, but I know you're familiar with that, that um, platform. Um, in short, what I, what I need as an artist, I can only speak for me. I, I, I don't want to say we here definitely um, more opportunities Um less gatekeeping like I, I could go into these deeper but I think if if you're an artist in the city you might know what I mean already less gatekeeping more support more honestly more funding opportunities um there are a lot of artists here you know I come from and I'm from the hood but I'm also from an academic 
uh, background. I went to I went to college, and I was privileged to be able to do that. Their grant applications are hard. Like even the language that you have to form around pursuing funding in this city is is a challenge for a lot of people, and they should not be shamed for that. They should not have to conform their language or the way they communicate about their own personal art. So I think that if there were more funding opportunities. Um, for people to be able to buy the materials they need and produce the products, projects that they're dreaming about. And it was like less um, tethered to these kind of like application form sort of things. I think that would be really helpful. I think what I've seen a lot of people do already um, since the protest started with like literally like trying to pay black people reparations. I'm all for that. I'm definitely pro reparations. Um, I'll, I'll let Brittany and Deep Shika jump in because I could like literally talk for an hour about this. Deep Shika, what do you need? Oh man, what do I need? Uh, I can feel that about how difficult um, grant funding is. We were lucky enough that Mirrors One, we were able to crowdsource everything, but this time around we were trying to look into getting grants and just, it, the process, if you're not familiar with it already, is so, it's awful. <laughs> it really is. Um, and another thing we, we were, we've been struggling with is finding space to be in that's also, you know, accessible monetarily um, so that we can, you know, put together readings or drag shows or this and that um, and not have to sort of dip into the money that could be going to our artists. Um, that's something that, you know, we think about a lot, yeah. And Brittany, um, I want to definitely ask you, what do you need? I'll tell you straight up right now, I need $50,000 to make this album into a play. And I have been looking for this money for over two years now, and I have applied and applied and applied. I've had people very in, in, in very high positions uh, edit my grants for me and like look it over and I've applied and applied applied and I still have not received uh, the funding that I need to make my album into a play. So I need $50,000. If anyone knows someone, hit me up. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important, you know, for us to say what we need and what we deserve. Um, I want to uh, thank you. Um, and before we go, I want to pass it to Eric Shuckers, a poet and manager of communications and programming for the Center for Creativity. He's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, the Art of Diversity competition and the uh, reviewers will also join us. Uh, Jaskia Jones, master's student in higher education management at the School of Education and vice president of programming for the graduate and professional student government. <gasps> Let me get my breath. <laughs> Betsy Farmer, Dean, School of Social Work and Gemma Jiang, director of organizational innovation, Swanson School of Engineering. Eric, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. And thanks to all of our panelists today. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I'm really grateful to everybody for taking part. Um, the Art of Diversity Showcase and Competition, um, which we held in collaboration with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion received almost 200 submissions from the university and from the greater communities, from university faculty, staff, students, and alumni. Um, as well as artists, musicians, performers, and writers across the region. Um, submissions ranged from paintings and drawings to poetry and spoken word. We had film and theater pieces, personal essays, music, dance, um, and fabric, digital and installation art. So we had a really um, wonderful representation of creativity across the board. It was really a dizzying, inspiring, um, and deeply moving representation of creative work. And the Center for Creativity and Office of Diversity and Inclusion are so grateful to all the creators who shared their work and to our review panel who took up the challenge of absorbing this work and determining our winners and honorable mentions. Because of this uh, extraordinary quality of the submissions, that job was not an easy one. You can get an idea of how difficult it was by visiting the gallery pages at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion website where all of our entries live and doing it yourself. We have a People's Choice Award that will be determined by your votes. So check out those galleries and vote for your favorite submission. Voting is open until midnight tomorrow and the winner will be announced next week. 
Today, we're announcing three category prizes and our reviewers award. Because the categories often overlap, we considered all the entries for each category. Our first category is cultural identity, where we looked at personal experiences and journeys and how those experiences and journeys intersect with ideas of cultural community. And presenting the honorable mentions and winners in this category is Betsy Farmer. Betsy? Thanks, Eric. Um, so I just wanna make it clear that I'm presenting these, but the entire review group looked at them and had input on who actually um, were selected as the winners. And it was incredibly difficult from among the, as Eric said, almost 200 submissions that we received um, and such a diverse range of submissions. So this was really challenging. But um, we as a group selected two honorable mentions and one winner in this category. So I'd like to congratulate um, one of our Pitt students, um, Alyssa Q, for the work Food is Culture. Um, and we also have an alumna who happens to be a graduate of the School of Social Work, which is why I wanted to present this category. Um, Morgan Overton's um, painting Emerge is also an honorable mention winner. And the winner in this category on cultural identity is actually a wonderful film um, by a student, um, Yan Chen Gi. Um, it's called End of Winter. And I think we were all moved by this. It was a very touching and stunning film around isolation of an international student dur during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and also in the context of a government that was creating this ominous political culture where students were not feeling safe and could be deported. And we really loved the way that some of the cultural signifiers were used in the film. There were um, references to WeChat, there were lily flowers. There were just ways in which the deeply personal sense of this sense of isolation and of danger and of lack of, so of um, solid belonging um, really um, intersected with expressions of identity that were, were just really moving to the group. So congratulations to all three of those winners. Thank you, Betsy. We really wanted to be able to show these, um, these winners to you today, but in the interest of time, we're gonna direct you and maybe um, sneakily also direct you to those gallery pages in order to view all the submissions and to vote. Um, we're not going to be able to show those to you today, but please check them out on the Office of Diversity and Inclusion website in the galleries. Um, again, take a look and vote for your favorite. Next is our award for social justice in which we looked at creative work as a call to action to intervention, to change. And presenting this category is Jeskia Jones. Jeskia. Thank you, Eric. So similar to Betsy, um, we have two honorable mentions that we will be presenting awards as to as well as an overall winner. Our first honorable mention is a University of Pittsburgh student. Their poem, poem The Black Struggle, highlights the inhumane brutality against the Black community while also calling and symbolizing the importance of unity. Help me congratulate Dol Monfiston. Our second honorable mention is another University of Pittsburgh student. Their slam poem, Our Boys, grapples with the way that young Muslim boys in this country are subject to criminalization based on the racist and Islamophobic assumptions. Congratulations, Juhi Faruqi, who also goes by the artist name, Shoes. And our winner of the social justice portion of the um, Artist Diversity Showcase is um, a faculty member of Pittsburgh. Their monologue, Chant, is a powerful representation of the search for meaning and strength and the uncertainty and violence that surrounds social justice and racial injustice in this country. It exerts a somatic power as viewers are made to both feel the nece necessary and physical stress, along with the hope that comes from standing up to injustice. Congratulations, Bria Walker. Thank you so much, Jaskia. Our final category is sociocultural topics, where we looked at submissions as wrestling with broad contemporary issues of society, culture, and diversity in ways that 
illuminated those issues in unique and creative ways. And presenting this category is Gemma Jiang. Gemma? Yes, thank you, Eric. So like the previous two categories, we also have two honorable mentions and one winner. So the first honorable, honorable mention is a University of Pittsburgh staff member, Jasmine Green, and her piece is called Thrift. And the second honorable mention is by University of Pittsburgh student, uh, Olivia Vance, and her piece is called, You Remember This Day When Your Father Cried. And then the winner is uh, another University of Pittsburgh student, Lori Huang, and her, uh, her piece is Viral Blame. So, and this is, so the Viral Blame is a simple but striking piece, carefully uses formal elements to convey the sense of loneliness and burden created when political leaders place the blame for global pandemic on one community. The image subverts the idea of a viral blame by being an easily shareable and highly impactful graphic that could easily go viral itself, carrying its message of resilience. So please join me in congratulating all three winners. Thank you so much, Gemma. And finally, our reviewers award. We assembled a short list of entries that surprised, moved, haunted, or delighted us, but which for one reason or another were not selected to win in the other categories. The full short list for our reviewers award is gonna be available on the Art of Diversity Showcase and Competition webpage. Um, but our reviewers award goes to a music piece by a local artist that we just couldn't get enough of and which we hope you'll hear tech willing as we end today. And that is Queen featuring Cue the Guitarist by local artist Inez. And with that, I'm gonna turn things back to Joseph to wrap us up. Joseph. Well, thank you all and congratulations. I wanna congratulate anyone who is making art right now. It is a difficult time and it is always a difficult time for artists to have their work being made, uh, created, uh, supported. We've heard what our artists need. Now it's up to all of us to take action. We want artists here. Artists clearly have a voice that we need, um, you know, in, in this moment and, and always. I'm really looking forward to kind of looking back at this era, era and seeing all of the art that was created that documents this time. It will be a huge story to tell. So I wanna thank Sarah Honey Young, Deepshika Sharma, Brittany Chantel. I wonder if you can quickly shout out whether you have a, like a handle that you want people to follow, a website, or just your like Cash App or Venmo. Feel free to share that. Um, my best website is shooter.honeyyoung.com. My name is Honey Rocks, H-U-N-Y-R-O-C-K-S on Instagram, Facebook, and Venmo, um, American Woman, project on Instagram and AmericanWoman.co to find out more about American Woman. Thank you so much. Deep Chico or Brittany, do you want to shout out something? Um, I would just say follow us at Rangoli at, at Rangoli PGH on Instagram and we're also on Twitter and if you want to follow me, I'm at the Loveless on Instagram. Uh, you can find me at my website, BrittanyChantel.com. You can also find me on Instagram at Brittany Chantel. Make sure you spell it right. Otherwise, it ain't going to come up. Um, B-R-I-T-T-N-E-Y-C-H-A-N-T-E-L-E. -E -E. Thank you for having me. Thank you, all three. I heard someone's doorbell rings. That means it's time to go to greet that person at the door. Um, thank you all for being here. And thanks, everyone who uh, watched along and chatted. Have a great day.